So, hello everyone. Hello, this is Giacomo speaking. Hello, well, I would like to welcome all of you again to the second event of the ISO Cosmic Duologue. The duologue today is uh, the topic of the duologue today is a black hole of intermediate mass, which is something that basically we all want, but they are not easy to, to be found. And we're here to hear about them. Um, I would like to start by thanking uh, everyone for being with us today and thanking uh, Maria, Tom and Marta for accepting our invitation, for organizing it and, and, and make it possible. Uh, just to give you an overview, very quickly, an overview of the structure. Um, the, the duologue is done. Uh, first of all, this is a duologue, so it means that we have two speakers that are basically highlighting basically the, the mysteries of, this, of the topic uh, which is discussed today and would help us to understand the open questions and maybe uh, have some ideas to move forward in the future. Um, the, they will give the two speakers, they will give 20 minutes talk each, and uh, this is followed then by the by the question and answer session. You can see already in the, in the YouTube channel, you have a, a, a live chat on the right hand side. You can use the chat yourself to make a question anytime. And uh, we saw last time also during the week, the first event, it was a very lively um, environment where people were sharing ideas, they were sharing opinions, they were sharing questions. So this is please feel free, use the chat. Please consider this is, this is a, a, a talk, this is a series of events made for professional astronomers, but uh, everyone is welcome to make questions, of course. Um, the, if you do not have a Google account, you can still send your question either by using the, um, there is a dedicated form on our page, duo.iso.org, where you can send your, your question, or you can use also the email isoduo2020 at iso.org. And again, we are, for, we are basically monitoring the email on, on live, so you will be, uh, your question will be given to a uh, pass to our uh, moderator, uh, Maria. Uh, what else? Uh, I think the result, yeah, if you, so, and, and after the event, the, the, the event will be still available on YouTube, so you can see it again uh, later. And also the chat will be available on YouTube, so also the chat will be visible and, and you can follow the questions there as well. So uh, with this, I would like to pass the word to Maria and I wish everyone an enjoyable uh, event again. Thank you very much for being with us today. Bye. Hello, everybody. My name is Maria Diatrio. I will be the chair today of this second use of Duologue. Uh, today's topic, as you've heard from uh, Giacomo, is uh, intermediate mass black holes, to be or not to be. This is an extremely exciting topic, especially at the dawn of the gravitational wave era. Um, on a short uh, historical perspective, uh, the 70s uh, saw the first mass measurement of a stellar mass black hole in an X-ray binary, Cygnus X1, and of a supermassive black hole at the galactic center. And it was already then that Weiler, Bakalin, Ostrucker, and others predicted the formation of black holes in the center of dense stellar clusters. So quoted from Weiler's 70s paper, actually, that I've recently read, King's recent observations of a mass excess of 1% at the center of M15 leads to a mass value of the order of 10 to the 4 solar masses for the black hole in a massive globular cluster. And impressively enough, in the 1978, Ries already complies in a diagram all the formation mechanisms that we consider today and that you'll hear from Martha in a minute. Um, however, the finding of such black holes has proven very challenging, as you will hear as well. Um, so today we have here at live <laughs> Marta Volonteri and Tom Macaron to explain us why we need intermediate mass black holes, how they would help us to better understand the universe, and why we have so many difficulties to detect them. So Marta is a researcher at the Institut d'Astrophysique de, de Paris. Uh, she has been trying to see it grow and uh, merge black holes <laughs> for many years, often failing, but having fun in the process, <laughs> as said by her. Tom is a professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at Texas uh, Technical University. He does observational work on a wide variety of things, but is most excited when something falls onto or into a black hole. <laughs> 
Um, so I will give now the floor directly to them. Um, for the audience, uh, as you heard from Giacomo, please write your questions in the chat should you have them also during their talks, and they will be addressed after the presentations. So, Marta, please, you can start. Okay, I hope that you can see my screen now. And uh, well, and hello everyone, um, and thanks to organizers for organizing this. It's it's really a fun event, and I hope you will enjoy it. And thanks also for asking me to be part of it. So in this discussion on intermittent muscular course, I will give a brief uh, and therefore very limited uh, theoretical review of what we think we know about intermittent muscular cause from a theoretical point of view. So to start with, I, I have to be honest, in my normal life, I usually don't use the terms intermittent muscular cause, mostly because to me, it's a bit of a moving target. Uh, intermediate between what? So I will start by discussing black holes that are not expected to be intermediate, and then we will discuss more about what they should be. So if this intermediate mass, it must be intermediate between something and something else. Um, so on the one hand, um, we have something that we would call low mass black holes, or at least to me, there are the low mass black holes, what I will call stellar mass black holes. These are black holes that have mass comparable to the mass of stars, of single stars. Uh, this, um, this field really was rejuvenated in some sense and had a big discovery with gravitational waves um, when LIGO Virgo detected black holes with masses that were above those that we had uh, previously detected using electromagnetic observations. Um, to date, as far as I know, the record holder for the most massive black hole of mass comparable to the mass of a single star is the GW170729. Well, <laughs> Um, which has a mass, uh, the mass of the remnant from the merger is about 80 solar masses. Um, so on one hand, we go from black holes with about five solar masses to about 80. Then we have a second group of black holes, massive black holes, or those that I usually call massive black holes. And I have two examples here. One is my favorite black hole, Sagittarius A star. Uh, it's at the center of our own Milky Way, so we can study it with really great accuracy and precision, and we know it has a mass uh, of 4 million solar masses. So you will see here one from 80 solar masses to about 4 million solar masses. And then we also have M87, also called the most photogenic black hole in the universe. Um, this is a, a, a picture of the photon ring around this black hole taken by the Event Horizon Telescope. Um, and it, it, it's interesting, M87, because the mass of this black hole was measured with three different techniques, uh, stellar dynamics, gas dynamics, and with the photon ring, um, with two of these techniques agreeing to a mass of two billion solar masses. So clearly these are a different regime in terms of mass compared to the first ones that we saw, the stellar mass black holes. So if we put this in a sort of, in a more statistical context, um, we can see here the distribution of masses. This is based on observations um, of the black holes that we know in the universe. So here in yellow, we have the stellar mass black holes. So as I said, the most massive that we have measured to date with LIGO Virgo is 80 solar masses, the mass of the remnant actually. Uh, then we go here to the massive black holes. You see here Sagittarius A star, M87. Um, you can see here there are black holes with masses in excess of 10, to 10 billion solar masses. And to my knowledge, the lowest mass, massive black hole that we have uh, in our uh, nearby universe is in the in NGC 205 with a mass of 6,800 solar masses. So this is what we know for now. And obviously you see here that there is something in the middle, which I would call a gap. And I think that this something is between, in between is what 
we will be discussing today as intermediate muscular calls. And as I said, um, different people have different definitions. Mine will be just black holes that fall in the gap between these two observational regimes. So in, in going a little more in the, the theory of this, um, when I think about stellar mass black holes, is that for me, the point here is stellar mass. So a mass similar to the mass of a single star. So this brings me to what can we say, not only about the mass of the stars, but the mass of the remnants, the black holes created by a single star. So here I have a somewhat dated uh, figure about the remnants as a function of the initial, the, the mass of the remnant as a function of the initial mass of the star, but I still think that this figure is very, very clear. Now you see here that um, this particular figure shows the final mass of the remnant as, as a function of the initial mass of the remnant at zero metallicity, meaning for stars that have primordial composition being only big bang nucleus synthesis, so hydrogen and helium basically. Um, now, when you are at low metallicities or, or even better at zero metallicity, both the strength or the weakness of nuclear reactions and the weakness of winds in this, let's say, red giant phase, um, make it possible for the remnant to have a mass which is comparable to initial mass of the star. So as you see here, <clears throat> when we go to from the mass of the black hole to the mass of the remnant at the low mass star you have some mass losses and you 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 lose some of the mass but then when you go to very high masses the mass loss is about 50 percent so you can have um, black holes with masses of few hundreds up to thousands of masses in principle as long as you can form stars that are this massive um, so in some sense, um, so here, let me sh show you here again um, what, what, I, what we call here the mass gap. So the mass gap that I defined earlier was just observational. It's the mass gap where we do not see black holes. There's also a theoretical mass gap in which in this particular mass range, the explosion of the supernova is very effective, very stable supernova, so you expect no remnant at all. But then above this mass gap, in principle, you can go on. And so I would say that the question of what is the most massive black hole that you can form from a star um, should be recasted as what is the most massive star that you can form at zero metallicity. And this, in some sense, will tell us what is the, 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 the upper end of the lower mass black hole um, envelope. Now you have formed black holes. Uh, through stellar evolution. There is a way to make black holes more massive than they started. Um, not only accretion of gas, I'm not going to talk much about this, but it's, uh, it's about merging black holes uh, one with the other. So here I just played a little bit with the LIGO Virgo slide and I created a sequence of mergers of black holes to make them more and more massive. Now to merge black holes, you need somewhat specific conditions in the sense that you need to put a lot of black holes in a very small space. Um, so you, you, you want to be in a dense environment, for instance, the center of a globular cluster or a nuclear star cluster. And then you will have mass segregation, the black holes will fall to the center, start interacting with very, very cool dynamics. And you keep on merging these black holes, but up to a certain point because these are all dynamical interactions. And so every time two black holes merge, you will have a recoil velocity, kick velocity for the um, conservation of linear momentum that is um, emitted in gravitational waves. But also when you have an interaction between three black holes, we will, you will have recoil velocity as well. And so this is going to be the, the, the key point in setting what is the most massive black hole that you have formed from mergers, which is basically given by a balance between the escape speed from the structure, the cluster where the black holes are merging, uh, and the mass of the final remnant. So what I think is important here is that there are these two points, I mean, forming a black hole from a single star, forming a black hole from merging more and more black holes is basically the base 
of everything I'm going to discuss later. In particular, now I will move to the massive black holes, so those like Sagittarius A star, NGC 205, M87, and I will connect their, um, the way that they are today to how they formed. In other words, what we call massive black hole seeds. Now we have, as I said, you know, let's take the example of M87, has a mass of 2 billion solar masses. Um, sometimes we say, uh, or I say, that there could be the black hole theory that says black hole, and all of a sudden from nothing you have a 2 billion solar mass black hole. Um, I, I'm a physicist, so I prefer to use different approach, which is based on physics and equations. And in this case, to form a black hole, you actually need to have specific physical conditions. And then these black holes, will, these are called seeds because they merge and they became, uh, become more and more massive with time. Now, this slide is a, a, an update, let's say a cosmological update on the original um, diagram from uh, Martin Rees in 1978 that Maria already mentioned. Um, all the ways that Martin suggested back then to form a, black hole, a massive black hole are still the same that we study today. We just put a more emphasis on um, various aspects, for instance, in this case, more on the cosmological aspect. So instead of starting from a gas cloud, Cloud, as Martin Rees did, here I will start from a proto-galaxy, so something which is made of dark matter and gas. You have no black hole in there. How can you make a black hole in that point? Now here I just um, took four particular, well, four, let's say, groups of scenarios that encompass most of those um, that we know. Um, but um, the first two rows here um, are basically some follow-ups on the evolution of single stars. And the bottom two rows are some variations on the dynamical channel. So um, in some sense, you can form black holes, as I said, from a single massive star. Um, here, this is um, the first scenario in which you just form stars at zero metal least. As I said, at zero metal least, you, you get the more bang for your back. You have the, a more massive black hole at the given stellar mass just because you have no metals. And so if you just take normal um, uh, star formation at zero metal least, some of the stars will be massive, hundreds of solar masses. And so they will leave behind some remnants also with mass about hundreds of solar masses or so. Then you can take this model, and this is the second row, to the extreme. Uh, under some conditions, um, and I'm not going into details here, um, the whole gas content or a very large fraction of the gas content in a proto-galaxy uh, with a mass, um, a mass in gas of about 10 to 6 solar masses can collapse and form a single massive star. So a single star, a supermassive star with a mass of about 10 to 5 solar masses. Now, if you are able to do that, and this happens in the universe, then just with this, you can form a seed black hole with a mass of about 10 to 5, 10 to, 5, uh, 10 to 4 to 10 to 6 solar masses. So, so these are just variations on star, normal star evolution. It just pushes the initial mass of the star and it, to high values and the metallicity to low values. Now, the last two um, approaches to forming black holes instead really rely on dynamics. Um, what you can do is to form either a supermassive star or a very massive star by merging many stars. This is the third row. So in this case, again, you have a similar scenario to when you merge black holes. You have mass segregation. Many, many stars will go to the center. They will start merging in a runaway fashion in a very fast way. Because if you just think about it, you want to form a very massive star that will collapse into a single black hole. This means that you have to do all this before any, supernova, any star there goes supernova. So you have about 10 million years for merging uh, tens or hundreds of star and form a very massive star um, that can collapse into black holes. So again, here you require low metallicity to have a high mass remnant from a high mass star. Um, the last point here is instead more related to merging more and more black holes. Again, you have a dense stellar system, you merge these black holes, 
And as I said earlier on, the bottleneck here is the escape rate speed from your cluster. Um, so you can get a more massive black hole if you can increase the escape speed from the cluster. And this is what can happen if you have a strong gas inflow. So as you see here, I mean, there is all this, the physics that goes into forming massive black hole seeds is very related to the physics that we study in the current universe to understand the masses of the stars and the, and the black holes that we see today. Except that this, if you, pay, if you notice, except for the very last uh, channel that merges black holes for the first three, the important point was always to have low metallicity, low metallicity or zero metallicity. Now, this brings us to very early times in the cosmic universe, because this means that you cannot have had many generations of stars pollute the universe with metals. This really brings you to the first billion years of the universe or so. So when you now uh, put this, um, this uh, black hole formation scenarios um, on the same figure that I showed you earlier on um, with the observations that we have today, as you see here, they all fall basically in this observational gap that we have at the moment. I also put here some more exotic ways of forming black holes that are not related to star formation or dynamics. But if we focus on these particular channels, from the theoretical point of view, we just fill the gap without any effort. Um, so in, from the theoretical point of view, I would say, what is an intermediate mass black hole? I mean, we have black holes all over the place. The challenge, of course, is to connect this theoretical view to the observational one in which there is nothing in there. Well, I think Tom will discuss this in much more detail, giving you all the information, the caveats and the techniques, but I will just say a few things on where theoretically we expect these black holes to be today. So as I said, again, most of these formation scenarios for uh, black holes that are in this mass gap happen at early times in the early universe. Um, in the first billion years of the universe. And today we are 13 billion years later, almost 13 billion years later. So the, the conditions have changed significantly. The galaxies are not the same, but also the black holes probably are not the same. So we have to think of ways to connect um, these two epochs and to see how we can still find these SIDS uh, out there. So uh, here I just review some um, a limited number of the various proposals. Um, but uh, in the first one is uh, looking for black holes in low mass galaxies. Now, this is kind of uh, tautological. Um, if you look for a low mass galaxy, you will probably find a low mass black hole in the center, but it's a bit more subtle than this. Um, now here, this figure shows the black hole mass as a function of velocity dispersion, the famous M sigma relation. Um, this black line is the, um, the observational um, relationship for more massive black holes. But as you see here, this sigma is very low. We focus here on low mass galaxies and low mass black holes. Now, these are all these uh, green and red points are the result of a theoretical model where we try to follow the evolution of black holes as a function of time. And what you see is that in these low mass galaxies, now this uh, at birth in the theoretical model, the green uh, black holes are about 100 solar masses, and the red black holes are about 10 to 5 solar masses. And these form very, very early on. And now 13 billion years later, most of these black holes still stay at their at the mass that is not very different. And it's not exactly the initial mass, but it's not very different. So if we want to find these uh, remnants of the seeds and some black holes that fall in the mass gap, looking in dwarf galaxies so in, at the very low mass end of the galaxy population uh, could be a possibility. The second one is to look in massive galaxies or in the Milky Way itself. Um, all theoretical models that I know um, that follow black hole evolution in a fully cosmological context with several caveats, of course, predict that in galaxies, there is not a single black holes, but there are many, many other, well, many other, a handful, say, in a, in a Milky Way galaxy like this, um, that just linger in the outskirts of galaxies. 
Uh, these black holes were just the result of failed mergers in the past. Um, they were embedded in a small galaxy that merged with the main galaxy, and then it was stripped, and the black hole was left in, in a very low density region with very little gas to accrete very few stars to, 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 to catch and bind. And so these would be um, black holes that have not grown much since the time of the merger that created them. And then the, 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 another way of looking for black holes, perhaps a bit more difficult, but we will see what Tom says about it, is to look for uh, black holes in the intergalactic medium. Um, Whenever you have a dynamical interaction between um, a binary of black holes and a third black hole, you will eject this black hole. It's, a, it's called a slingshot. Uh, in a similar way, whenever two black holes merge, they will also recoil because gravitational waves carry away linear momentum. And so the binary recoils in the opposite direction. So you will have black holes flying away from wherever they're merging. Um, sometimes with, velo with, with velocities of tens of kilometers per second, but up to 10,000 kilometers per second or so. And so these would be on the radial orbits, leaving the galaxies and perhaps just, you know, hanging out in the intergalactic medium along with all these, um, these photons that make the CMB. So these are all ways to think of finding black holes that have not grown much from the initial, um, their initial mass. Um, and something else that I want to say, and, and I'm not sure whether Tom will cover it much, but since uh, I think that this is one of the um, most exciting um, options and opportunities that we have in the future. So we have seen how LIGO Virgo detected the most massive black hole to date. Um, rotational waves have an, also an enormous power of discovery for intermediate mass black holes or whatever black holes that you want to think of. Now, this figure shows you the sensitivity of LISA, which is an ESA satellite planned to uh, be launched in the third 2030s. Um, and this is the sensitivity for a third generation ground-based experiment, such as Einstein Telescope or Cosmic Explorer. And you see here, so this is the redshift out which you can detect uh, these merging black holes. The x-axis is the total mass of the binary, and here it assumes a mass ratio of 0.3. Now, if you look at this, between LISA and the third generation detectors, in principle, we could detect all black hole mergers with an intermediate mass between ratios zero and two. So if black holes, intermediate mass black holes are there and they merge, we will see them, no question asked. And with gravitational waves, you measure the mass exquisitely well. And then more you know, closer to us, but this is um, in some sense, the gravitational wave equivalent of tidal disruption events. Uh, we can have a, a massive black hole uh, and a stellar mass black hole. So this is say, say 10 solar masses and 10 to six solar masses. And this is what we call extreme mass ratio spiral or EMBRI. And this allows you to measure the masses of a black hole in the nearby universe. This is a figure from GEAR 2009 showing the redshift out to which you can observe these embrace. Now, the beauty here is that while um, here in the um, LISA and um, so here in the top panel, I'm showing the mergers among two intermediate mass black holes, with embrace, you need only one intermediate mass black hole and the second would be just a normal stellar mass black hole. So um, it would be perhaps easier to imagine in terms of uh, rates. So this brings me to my uh, summary um, where I would start with what is an intermediate mass black hole? To be honest, as I said, it meets a moving target. As, as we detect more and more black holes with high mass from the stellar mass regime and uh, let, you know, lighter black hole from the massive regime, then this, this intermediate regime shrinks and shrinks. So perhaps at some point we'll just fill it. Um, if we talk about single stars, let me rephrase the most massive of the black hole that you can find is about the most massive star that you can make at, at zero metallicity. I think you know, very often we talk about stellar origin black hole instead of stellar mass black holes. 
And to me, this is the key point. If, if you talk about the origin, perhaps the key point is not the mass of the black hole, but the mass of the star. Well, merging black holes makes black holes more and more massive. Uh, uh, but we are Kickstarter recoils. There is a limit to the maximum mass that you can make just merging black holes uh, out there. Where should we look? Our clusters, dwarf galaxies, the outskirts of massive galaxies, my favorite, the intergalactic medium, just because it makes it very, very hard for observers. Um, but you can find them in different places, created by different scenarios, by different physical processes, so with different characteristics. I haven't gone into that because of time, but you can find different properties for each of the mechanisms that I described. And how should we look? With photons, as Tom will say, or with traditional waves, which I think it's, it's, it's really extremely powerful because it can measure mass. There is no question asked there about what is the mass of the black hole that you're looking at. And I will stop here. And I will just leave you with a cool movie that you can watch while uh, Maria starts the discussion. Okay, thanks very much, Martha, and thanks for keeping the time. Um, perhaps while the movie is running, <laughs> a couple of quick clarification questions that we got from the audience. The first one is regarding um, the most massive uh, black hole you can do from a star. And the question is why um, at metallicity zero we get the largest black hole masses and in the sense of why cannot you do so massive stars when the metallicity is more than zero? Yeah, there are two reasons. Um, so one is related to um, the nuclear uh, explosions, the nuclear production itself. Uh, this was work done in the in the in the mid '80s and more recently by Montero. Um, if you have zero metallicity, you don't have much uh, CNO, so the production of energy itself is lower. So you the the the, the explosion that you get from nuclear reaction will be lower as well. So you don't tear apart the star uh, at the last moment. Also, um, during what I would call the red giant phase, but you know, the, during the late stage evolution of stars, usually you have pulsations and winds um, that take away mass. Now, the strength of the winds depends on the opacity of the material that you have. So if you have zero metallicity or very low metallicity, the opacity will be lower, and so the winds will be weaker. This means that not much mass can be carried away by the winds as, um, as, as they leave the star. Um, so this is the reason why if you have no metals, well, when I say metals here, it's really heavy elements. If you have no heavy elements, but you have very light elements in two different ways, so just the explosion and nuclear, uh, nuclear reactions and wind, winds, you're getting a more massive remnant for the mass of the star you started with. Okay, thank you very much. Another question is, um, given that uh, the sigma uh, measured for, for massive black holes is uh, outside from the sphere of influence of the black hole, how come that we have an M-sigma relation at all? Uh, sorry, I couldn't hear you. Sorry. So given that um, in the M, for the M sigma relation, given that sigma is outside of the sphere of influence of the black hole, is measured outside. So how come that we have an M sigma relation at all? Well, I think that this is the million dollar question since 2000 <laughs> when this was discovered. Uh, and I think that this was the reason why it was so striking at the very beginning. Um, I mean, in principle, you expect the mass of the black hole to correlate with the velocity dispersion within the sphere of influence because it's the black hole that determines the speed of the stars inside the sphere of influence, so very close to the black hole. Outside, there should not be a dynamical link. So this means that something set the two at the same time. Um, usually, the way I think, so usually these. I said, okay, there are 100,000 models out there. I don't want to, to pick on one or the other, but usually we think it's feedback, meaning that the black hole, as it grows, inject energy into the galaxy. And the galaxy can accept energy out to a certain point before pushing back, meaning not sending any more gas to the black hole or just you know, 
unbinding. Um, so we think that the balance between injecting energy and disrupting your environment is what sets this relationship. Again, it's a, it's a relationship that we measure first, and then we try to explain. Um, so I hope that this is sufficient for now. Yes. And um, yeah, finally, perhaps a short comment, and then we move on to Tom, and um, somebody in the audience who says a comment on ground-based third generation mass measurements. What we measure is the detector frame mass. So we need to fold in the uncertainty and the luminosity distance estimation to get the mass of the source. Are you asking for a comment? No, no, no. It was just okay to leave it there, and uh, just it was regarding the, the precision of mass measurements, and and with this we can we can move to Tom, I think. So thank you very much, Marta. Okay. All right, so uh, first, uh, thank you very much to the organizers for putting this event on and to Marta for a really nice introduction to the topic. I'm gonna to focus on the observability of intermediate mass black holes. Uh, and uh, just wanted to show a couple images to show where I am since I think a lot of people don't know where Texas Tech University is. It's in Lubbock, Texas, which is the home of Buddy Holly among other uh, people. All right, so I'm gonna start with the definition I'm gonna use for the purposes of this talk. Um, so, uh, and it's gonna be fairly similar to what Marta said earlier. So something that's greater than the mass a single star can produce, but less than the mass of the supermassive black holes and active galactic nuclei. Uh, and if we're just looking for an empirical set of numbers to work with, we might use something in the range of about a hundred to about a million solar masses. Um, and it's, it's in some people's definitions, it's important that this object not be in the center of a galaxy, uh, but there has been a lot of good work on finding these lower mass active galactic nuclei and I do want to talk about that, especially because there are some people that just consider anything in this intermediate mass range to be an intermediate mass black hole. So I will be talking about low mass AGN and how we go about finding those in addition to things that aren't in the nucleus of a galaxy. All right. So I think uh, the first thing that we should do is we should think about how we found supermassive and stellar mass black holes, because probably we're going to want to use similar techniques going forward to uh, look for intermediate mass black holes and just think about how to adapt the techniques. So the first real evidence we ever had for uh, uh, in a black hole of any kind came from the galaxy M87, which is shown here. In 1918, Haber-Curtis noticed that there was a ray of light uh, coming out from the center of this galaxy. And by the way, this is the same galaxy that, for which Marta showed this event horizon telescope image. So it's one of the nearest and most massive black holes, and it has a relativistic jet coming out. As the third Cambridge uh, catalog of radio uh, sources came out, people started finding more and more of these galaxies with strong radio emission. And over the course of the 1960s, people started to associate that tentatively with supermassive black holes. Um, also in the 1960s, uh, people started doing X-ray astronomy. Uh, and from some of the early rocket flights, they started seeing these uh, stellar sources of X-rays in the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, and we now know that Cygnus X1, which is shown in this artist impression here, and was found by uh, Boyer and collaborators in 1965. Uh, we now know that it has a stellar mass black hole as the accreting object in it. Um, and it turns out accretion disks around active galactic nuclei are also strong sources of X-ray emission, but because they're further away, uh, those were discovered a bit later, mostly in the 1970s and beyond. So the other things that you can do is you can look for orbital evidence of uh, a black hole. And for supermassive black holes, uh, it, with the exception of Sagittarius A star, you don't see a single star that you can trace the orbit of. And instead, you have to use statistical evidence for the presence of a black hole there. And this was kicked off by uh, Wall Sargent and Peter Young in the late 1970s, where they saw in M87 that the stellar velocity dispersion shot way up towards the center of the galaxy. Uh, it turns out that you need to use more sophisticated modeling than they did at the time to have really strong evidence of a supermassive black hole there. But as people have done that, uh, it's continued to remain uh, evident. Um, another interesting idea is in the Milky Way galaxy, you could look for a star orbiting a black hole uh, where the star is too widely separated to be donating mass to the black hole. And so you don't start an accretion disk in that system. Uh, Virginia Trimble and Kip Thorne tried this in the late 1960s and uh, it didn't work when they tried it, but uh, about 50 years later, uh, Todd Thompson uh, had a paper that came out uh, last year that was successful in using this technique, 
There's also a couple papers by geezers using MUSE data in uh, Milky Way globular clusters finding black holes with no accretion. Uh, and what we really needed was the era of mass spectroscopic surveys in order to be able to use this technique. If you tried to make your best guesses about where to look, uh, you still had too low of a probability of finding anything to take advantage of this technique. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we had the LIGO results a few years ago that I think Marta talked about the, the LIGO data better than I, I could do at, at this point. So I'm going to move forward from that. All right, so now how do we estimate the masses of these things? So I'm going to start with the stellar mass black holes. Uh, so the easiest way to, so for the stellar mass black holes, you can do things in a fairly straightforward way. So what you can do is you can make repeated measurements of the radial velocity of the donor star as it goes around in its orbit. Uh, and you do that by getting its Doppler shift. Uh, and so by doing that, what you can do is you can get the radial velocity amplitude and you can get the orbital period. Uh, and in some cases, that's enough to prove that the object around which you're orbiting is massive enough to be a black hole, but it's never good enough to give you a really precise mass estimate. To get a precise mass estimate, you have to understand what the inclination angle of the system is. Uh, because if you have a face-on system, the radial velocities are not measuring the full uh, actual motions. And then you also need to know what the mass ratio is, uh, because you have a roughly even mass ratio, uh, then the donor star is uh, only a fraction of the orbital separation. So once you correct for those things, then you can get precise masses for the black holes. And it turns out the inclination angle is the hardest part to, to get done correctly. All right. Now, for the supermassive black holes, there's a variety of techniques that people use. Uh, so the most commonly used one is the stellar dynamics technique, where you look at the mass to light ratio as a function of position, and you see a sharp spike in the mass to light ratio at the center of the galaxy. And you can do this either with stellar dynamics or with uh, orbiting gas dynamics. Um, there's another stellar uh, dynamical technique that you can use that's much more precise, but much harder to find targets for, which is to make use of masers. And so if you have masers, in addition to measuring radial velocities, uh, you can actually measure the proper motions of the masers. So you get full 3D uh, velocity information for the tracers of the dynamics. Uh, and with the masers, you get really ultra precise measurements of the black hole masses. And those are kind of the gold standard that people try to calibrate off of to make sure that they're doing the other techniques correctly. Uh, the other thing that you can do uh, is you can use a technique called reverberation mapping. Uh, and what you do here is if you have a a black hole that's accreting quickly, uh, then it turns out the accretion light can often swamp out your uh, stars. And so you can't do good stellar dynamical masses. Uh, instead, what you can do is you can use the accretion light from the central engine, and it will light up uh, gas further away from the black hole. And that gas further away from the black hole will emit emission lines. And you can measure the radial velocities of the emission lines and the time delays from the central engine to where the emission line is produced. And by doing that, you can map out where the emission line nearly needs to be coming from using those time delays. Uh, and that gives you a, a good geometric technique to get black hole masses as well. Um, you can also use the black hole shadow, like in the Event Horizon Telescope. Uh, and this gives you great uh, measurements, but it's limited to probably a handful of objects before we figure out how to do radio astronomy in space. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's, again, like the Masers, it's a great calibrator, but it's not the best way of doing things if you want to build up big samples. All right, so now I want to talk about searches versus confirmation and mass estimation, because uh, what I think we've seen in, in a lot of cases is the ways that you can most robustly find that you have a black hole present are different than the ways that you can get the masses measured accurately. Um, so just for example, the, the jets and the x-rays, um, those are both really, really hard to explain in any way except for an accreting supermassive black hole if you see them coming from the center of a, a distant galaxy. Uh, but they don't uh, necessarily give you good ways to make precise mass estimates. Uh, for the x-rays, there are ways that you can get rough ass ma uh, mass estimates, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes uh, because uh, that is an important technique. Now, if you want to do the dynamical searches for uh, black holes uh, or use masers, you need to know where to look, but then you can get much better mass estimates. All right, so now um, where we should look. So uh, Marta covered this pretty well, but I wanted to just show this slide uh, just because I think this is a topic that bears repeating. Uh, there are two correlations between the black hole mass and the properties of a galaxy. So one is this M sigma relationship that, that she mentioned, uh, that when you have a higher radial velocity dispersion in a galaxy, you have a higher black hole mass. The other one is the uh, Megorian relation, sometimes called. So the, just the fact tip, that the typical bulge will have a black hole of about 0.1% of the total mass of the bulge. And probably these tie together in some way. Um, now, there's a big question about how well these relations should hold up for low mass systems like dwarf galaxies 
and especially like globular clusters, which don't seem to have any dark matter in them. Um, and uh, so that's something that uh, we need to test empirically. All right, so now where do we look? So uh, I just want to remind everyone of the kind of classical astronomers joke about uh, where does the drunk, in this case, uh, Barney from The Simpsons, uh, look for his keys when he's lost them. And hopefully these aren't his car keys. Uh, and he looks under the lamppost. And it's not that that's necessarily where it's most likely that he left them. It's that that's where the light is. So that we, where we want to look are not just the places that it's most likely to have the objects, but the places where we have a hope of finding them. And so we could talk about Marta's uh, suggestion about looking in the intergalactic medium during the discussion phase. But uh, even if that's one of the best places to look from a theoretical point of view, uh, it's a really tough one for an observational point of view. And there, there may be some tricks that could be applied there depending on uh, her answers to some of the questions about the theory that I'll ask later. Um, but it's, it's certainly not as easy as looking in the center of a globular cluster. All right, so now let's think about some of the tricks that we might use to figure out how to narrow our searches down. Uh, so there's a couple of uh, theoretical ideas about which globular clusters might be the best places to look for the uh, intermediate mass black holes, assuming that some fraction of globular clusters have them and some fraction don't. And there's a couple of cases of people talking about the, you know, about the black hole having some effect outside the sphere of influence that you might actually look for. Uh, so one thing that you can look for is something called a Bacall-Wolf cusp. And the idea is that uh, if you have a massive object sitting at the center of a a stellar dynamical system, you may attract a, some extra stars so that your surface brightness profile rises uh, towards the center in a way that you wouldn't otherwise expect. Uh, and that's what's uh, meant by the central surface brightness slope here on this axis. But the other thing is that uh, stars will, uh, especially stars on eccentric orbits, will fly near the black hole, pick up high velocities, and then interact with other stars. And so that injection of energy can puff up the core of a cluster. And so you might look for clusters that have fairly large core to half light radii. Uh, so you would never, so according to the theorists, at least you would never look in these really core collapse clusters for intermediate mass black holes because the interactions with the black hole would puff up the cluster too much. Okay, so it was done in this really nice paper by Noel and Baumgart is they did some simulations of globular clusters, some with intermediate mass black holes, some with stellar mass black holes, and some with no black holes. Uh, and then uh, Noyola observed the simulations and uh, she converted what the simulations were giving you into the same kind of data sets that you might get if you observed a real cluster. And this is the kind of thing that I think we should see more and more of from observers and theorists working together, uh, because I think sometimes we think we have disagreements between observation and simulation. And it, what it is is that we're not really comparing the same things. Okay, so in their uh, analysis, what they found is the objects with the black dots here are the systems where you have uh, an intermediate mass black hole in the simulation. And so I suggest that this is the kind of cluster that you want to look at most closely uh, if you want to have the best chance of actually finding something. Uh, I wouldn't say that finding that a cluster happens to be in this part of phase space in this diagram observationally is direct evidence of an intermediate mass black hole, uh, in part because a different uh, paper by Vesperini and Trenti found some different conclusions doing similar things. And I think it really gets down into the nuts and bolts of the simulations and how you observe the simulations to figure out what's really going on. Uh, but I think these kinds of things can be indicative and they can be helpful for using observational resources in the best way. All right, next, uh, stellar dynamics. So uh, it's also dangerous to just use dispersional stellar dynamics. And there's kind of a long history to this. So uh, the cluster Omega Sen has shown some evidence for a rise in uh, central uh, mass to light ratio based partly on the velocity dispersion but partly on some of the higher moments of the velocity distribution of the stars. Um, but you run into a lot of dangers when you start looking for uh, black holes using these kinds of techniques in small stellar systems. Uh, so when you have a supermassive black hole, your sphere of influence contains 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 9 stars probing the gravitational potential well. When you have an intermediate mass black hole, your sphere of influence contains a lot fewer stars. And so some random effects can lead to what appears to be an increase in the velocity distribution a lot more easily. Um, some other things, uh, you need to know the cluster center very well. Um, and you also have to account for the fact that you can have Brownian motion of the black hole. Uh, and I think the most important one is actually point two here, uh, that there's a process called mass segregation in relaxed stellar systems, that if you sort of think of the stars as acting like a gas, uh, the gas will approach a uniform temperature. And that means the heaviest objects will have the lowest velocities and they'll sink to the center of the cluster. And for a globular cluster, which is a very old stellar population, the heaviest objects are going to be stellar mass black holes, neutron stars, and white dwarfs. 
And those all, all have very high mass to light ratios compared to normal stars. Uh, and as a result of this, you have to work really hard to prove that you don't have a cluster of stellar remnants uh, rather than the intervening blast, mass black hole that you might think you have. Uh, and this was pointed out in the 70s by Illingworth and King. Uh, and then it was pointed out again uh, much more recently by Baumgarten collaborators. Um, so the, the one thing that dynamic that I think could be a rock solid signature, but that we haven't seen yet is individual very fast stars. So if you have a star that's, uh, you know, in well within the sphere of influence, it may be moving too fast to explain with a cluster of stellar remnants and it may have too circular an orbit or sorry, too regular an orbit without perturbations. Um, so individual fast stars, I think the thing to look for, we may need better angular resolution for our spectrographs and better astrometry in order to look for these things. All right, so now the other way that we can go and look for these things is uh, using accretion. And um, uh, so I think the topic of intermediate mass black holes first started uh, in part because of the detection of X-ray sources in a bunch of Milky Way globular clusters, which could have been explained that way. Um, those got killed by the discovery that those things were neutron stars. Um, and uh, it got reinvigorated in the Chandra and XMM era by people looking at the ultra-luminous X-ray sources. And this plot, I think, shows, uh, first of all, why people started considering this possibility, and secondly, why people started rejecting this possibility. Uh, so this track here uh, in the lower right shows what the stellar mass black holes do, um, which is that as they go up in luminosity, they go up in temperature. All right now, the temperature of, of black hole accretion disks should scale as the mass to the minus one quarter power, and that's because they get bigger as you go to higher mass black holes. And so if you see something with a low temperature but a high luminosity, that tells you of a big characteristic size for your accretion disk. And that might be explained well by an intermediate mass black hole. Problem is, as people started making many observations of these systems, what they found was that the temperature was inversely correlated with the luminosity. And that was suggestive of going above what's called the Eddington luminosity and having radiation pressure puff up the flow. Uh, and the, the really the nail in the coffin for the idea that these things were all intermediate mass black holes was when Matteo Bacchetti found pulsations from one of them. And since then, pulsations have been seen from a bunch of them. Uh, so it doesn't uh, exclude the possibility that there may be a source or two in this cloud that might be an intermediate mass black hole, but they clearly can't be mostly intermediate mass black holes. All right, now, the flip side of that is right around the time this plot came out, there was also a discovery of this source called HLX1. And this was found in the 2XMM catalog survey uh, due to careful follow-up. And what was found was an object uh, that peaks at around 10 to the 42 ergs per second. So that's Eddington luminosity for a 10 to the four solar mass black hole. Um, and uh, that was already really intriguing because that's much brighter than any of these other things get. Uh, but then what was really interesting was that the source showed a change in its spectral characteristics as a function of luminosity. When it was bright, it showed a quasi thermal spectrum like an accretion disk. And when it got fainter, um, it showed a power loss spectrum. And it, this happened at about 2% of the peak luminosity. And uh, X-ray binary certainly, and probably AGN, showed these same kinds of state tra transitions at a few percent of the peak luminosities. Uh, and so this isn't a dynamical mass estimate, but it's a, a characteristic behavior that I think gives us very strong uh, hints that this is an intermediate mass black hole. Uh, uh, Natalie Webb also found radio peaks at the state transitions, which is another characteristic behavior of the stellar mass black hole. All right, so now the, what we want, might want to do, though, too, is to be able to look closer to our own neighborhood, find intermediate mass black holes uh, where we can go and do dynamical follow-up. And the best place to look for that is in uh, globular clusters. All right, so um, uh, in 2003, Andrea Merloni and collaborators came out with a paper where they showed that there's a nice correlation among black hole mass, X-ray luminosity, and radio luminosity that fits both stellar and supermassive black holes. And if you apply that, uh, what you realize is that the radio band is the best way to look for faint accreting intermediate mass black holes. All right, so um, in this paper by Tremu and collaborators, we went and we looked at a very large sample of Milky Way globular clusters, and we didn't find any evidence for any of them showing an intermediate mass black hole. We had all upper limits. All right, now, there are a couple caveats there too. Uh, one is that you have to assume a certain fraction of the Bondi Hoyle accretion rate from the interstellar medium. Uh, we've typically assumed 3%, which is uh, taking some work from active galactic nuclei and scaling it. Uh, and then the other question is uh, you have to 
So in a few cases, you have measurements of the gas in the globular clusters and they agree well with theoretical predictions, uh, but you still have to make some assumptions about that. Um, uh, so uh, another thing that you might like to do is to do some uh, searches of uh, bigger samples of globular clusters. And the way to approach that is by doing a stacking analysis on nearby galaxies. And uh, this paper gives an example of that. All right, so now uh, I want to talk about the smallest AGN. So apart from HLX1, I think uh, the low mass AGN or we have good uh, evidence for black holes in this intermediate mass range. Uh, and I'm going to talk about three kind of examples with three different techniques. All right, so um, one comes from this paper by Simon Vaughn and collaborators. Uh, so there's also a nice relationship among black hole mass, break frequency in the power spectrum of the black hole. So if you look at the variability, make a Fourier spectrum, and look where it shows a break frequency, uh, and the accretion rate. Uh, and this uh, makes a lot of sense, and it's been well calibrated on supermassive black holes and stellar mass black holes. Uh, and using it, you find that this galaxy, NGC 4395, uh, probably has a black hole of around 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 5 solar masses. Um, and this is a, in a galaxy with what's called a pseudo bulge. And so that's kind of the kind of place where you might expect to see anomalously low central black hole masses. Uh, another thing that you could do is you can use the velocity widths of emission lines. And that's a way that you could build up a massive sample of uh, low mass AGN, uh, but they'll all be at high accretion rate. And this is uh, kind of illustrating how this works from paper by Green and Ho. And then the final thing you can do is you can look for things where you see clear evidence for accretion onto a supermassive black hole. Uh, but when you go and do dynamical measurements, you either measure a, a lower mass black hole, or in this case, uh, you find an upper limit to the black hole mass that's uh, well under a million solar masses. And so this is kind of showing the accretion evidence from a paper by Nyland and the collaborators in 2017. Uh, there have been an earlier paper by Jun Nguyen and collaborators in 2015, where they found that this black hole had to be less than about 400,000 solar masses. All right, so all of these techniques can be a, a good way to go about doing things. And, and if you have accretion evidence and then you get an upper limit on the black hole mass, that's a way that you can get around some of the problems about it being really hard to get dynamical masses for the um, lower mass black holes. All right, and so one other thing I want to mention are uh, tidal disruption events. Uh, so the idea is if you have a star that flies close enough to a black hole, it can be tidally destroyed by that uh, interaction. Um, now, if you have a white dwarf, a white dwarf is so uh, dense and compact uh, that for most supermassive black holes, it'll be swallowed whole if it gets too close to the black hole. And it can't be tidally destroyed even when passing into the innermost st stable circular orbit. Um, for an intermediate mass black hole, that's not the case. And there's a second thing that the intermediate mass black holes can do, which is in some cases, if a relatively low mass white dwarf passes clo enough, close enough to an intermediate mass black hole, it can be tidally compressed, and that compression can trigger heating, which then triggers nuclear fusion, and you can get kind of a special type of supernova explosion. Um, so there have been a few suggestions for events that might be results of white dwarf tidal disruptions, but I would say they right now they all have more mundane explanations that are quite viable. Uh, but I think this is a, a way that we might probe a very large volume in looking for intermediate mass black holes in, in the future, especially as things like LSST get online. All right, so now towards the future. Uh, so I'm gonna uh, skip through, through most of the gravitational wave stuff because uh, Marta already covered it better than I do here. But one thing I wanna mention is if we have cases where we have an intermediate mass black hole that's close to a supermassive black hole, especially our own Sagittarius A star, there are some extra techniques that you might apply. Uh, so there's a paper by Nowsen collaborators where they suggested that the orbits of those S stars would show perturbations because of this. Uh, but I think if that were going on, uh, you would see it from pulsar timing even more easily. We just need to find any pulsar anywhere close to Sagittarius A star. And then you have a gravitational wave detector that's sitting right next to your gravitational wave emitter. Uh, in the x-rays, I think there's a couple things we can do. One is that we can do uh, better collecting area and better um, time monitoring capabilities. We can start measuring power spectra of more of these low mass AGN. Uh, the other thing that we can do is if we have better imaging in the hard x-rays, we can measure the spectral states of uh, off-nuclear x-ray sources a lot better. Uh, in the optical and infrared, we, if we get better astrometry, uh, we could start to do mass measurements on smaller scales in, the, in AGN and then star clusters using stars that might be closer into the sphere of influence and tracing individual stars rather than sample stars. Uh, and there was an interesting paper that I saw while I was preparing for this that 
There also may be some infrared nebular lines that would only show up when you had lower mass black holes. Uh, and then in the radio band, again, we could do better pulsar measurements with things like square kilometer array and next generation VLA. Um, but also we could start to look uh, in nearby globular clusters a lot better. And if we have some of these wandering black holes, if they have a little bit of accretion, uh, if we had something like the next generation VLA, we might actually be able to measure the proper motions of those black holes. Uh, and that would give us a distinctive uh, signature of what's going on there. Uh, so I think that's what I wanted to say here. Um, and so I'm going to wrap up. Thank you very much, Tom. <laughs> OK, so let's start then. Uh, I had a couple of questions from the audience lens uh, left for Marta. So perhaps we address those first. So the first one was about your movie, Marta. <laughs> um, what was the typical time to form the massive black hole? Uh, you're muted, Marta. OK, I think then. Uh, so uh, I'm not 100% sure what forming black holes means in the sense that black Massive. holes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Black, so the formation time of black holes in this particular movie, in, this, in, that, movie, um, in that model that was uh, Michael Tremel's work, um, black holes form pretty much early on in the first billion years or so of the universe, and then they grow for the rest of the time. So in, in the movie, at some point you could see a white dot appearing somewhere in the middle of the galaxy typically, and that was the birth of a massive black hole, seed, so at, at its initial mass. Okay. Then we had one related to the previous comment that we did after your talk on gravitational wave detection and the precision of masses. So the question was, is a relative um, mass uncertainty of 50% at redshift of two good enough? Totally for me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let's be honest, sorry. Uh, I mean, Tom can, can answer later, but I mean, currently for mass measurements of black holes using something else, photons, let's say, all the techniques that I know, I think that the uncertainty, both, both um, statistic, the uncertainty, statistical uncertainty is about 0.3 dex, up to 0.5 for measurements that, are, that use relationships. So for me, 50% totally fine. Uh, or the, to me, a factor of 10 is totally fine. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Some a few of the best studied stellar mass black holes have much better mass estimates, but the that otherwise I agree with what you said. Yeah. Okay, great. And perhaps then, uh, since the audience is still very quiet, so let me ask you something, uh, Tom. So about this, looking for black holes into the IGM or ISM. Yeah. So can we do it at all? <laughs> I think the if if the black hole escapes by itself, I think probably not. Uh, if the black holes carry a few stars with them, or if they carry some gas with them, which I've seen suggested in some quarters that they might, uh, then you might have a chance. And so that, that's a kind of a question I wanted to turn on to turn around to Martha. How likely are these ejected black holes to carry some stars with them? It depends. Or to carry some, yeah. uh, other gas. So it depends on the particular um, formation scenario. Uh, so in terms of gas and stars, uh, well, they carry gas if there was gas around them. Uh, they can capture some on the, on, the, on the way. But overall, it cannot be larger than the mass of the black hole because it must be bound gas. So and, you know, and, and then if, if you think of the time to consume that gas at the Eddington limit, it would be about 45 million years. Um, in terms of stars, is, is, is similar. The amount of stars that you get is similar. In fact, um, there were some suggestions that to look for these ejected black holes, you have to look for extremely compact uh, stellar clusters. Um, and, and I have to be honest, I was kind of joking when I said that this was my favorite because it put you know, a lot of difficulties on observers. Uh, it just that, you know, they, they could be there. I, I, I honestly agree with you that the, it's, they are the hardest black holes to find. Um, but it's cool. Yeah. So, so if you had 45 million years, what, what do you think the typical speed is? 
Oh, for the ejection, uh, can go, well, okay, so it's, it's, uh, the speed could be anywhere between 10 and thousands of kilometers per second. So uh, it depends on, in the, in, in the case of the recoil, gravitational wave recoil, it depends on the um, mass ratio, the absolute value of the spin and the relative um, orientation of the spin of the two black holes. In the case of three body interactions, it depends mostly on the separation between the two, the, the, the single black hole and the binary at the time of ejection. So you can have a variety, but I think that the interesting ones are those with relatively large speeds, several hundreds to thousands of kilometers per second. Okay. Uh, yeah, so in 45 million years, you can get pretty far away from the galaxy where it was born also. Um, where would you guess would be the most nearby one of these things? Oh. <laughs> uh, the most nearby. So to have one of these, any of these effects, you need to have had a, either a merger between two black holes or an interaction with multiple black holes. Mm -hmm. So if you if we think of the low mass end or what I would call the low mass end, then you know you have you can have ejections from globular clusters on, on during the formation. So you should have some in the Milky Way in principle, though as it just showed, there are not that many intermediate mass black holes seen in globular clusters in the Milky Way. Perhaps they were all ejected. That's why you don't yeah. see them. I think that's not a crazy idea that they were all ejected. There is a very nice paper by uh, Melvin Davies and Cole Miller looking at uh, um, uh, what happens if you eject black holes and you should should you form another one. But I, um, in terms of something a bit more massive, so created by the same interaction but with more massive black holes, then you have to go look for something that happens in the center of a galaxy. As you go down in mass, in galaxy mass, the number of black hole mergers you expect to happen goes down just because the merger rate is higher for high mass galaxies. So I think that there is some sort of fine balance. Uh, yeah. So I, at least from the observation perspective, I think the ones that happen in the nuclei of galaxies be more useful because my impression is that would be more likely to happen when there's some gas around that you could pull out. Um, and They're probably rare. Yeah. Uh, but the, the one thing that you might have going for you is if you could do some kind of all sky VLBA or a, a very long baseline interferometry survey, um, then you might see proper motions from those things that might be anomalous because they really just aren't AGM that have large proper motions. But if something like this happened fairly nearby and at 10,000 kilometers a second, I think that should give you measurable proper motions uh, in a you know 10 or 15 year baseline. And so you said all sky VLBI. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think it's not crazy to do. Um, you know, they're doing the VLA sky survey right now, which is an all sky survey. Uh, I think it's really more a question of computational resources and how bright the targets will be uh, than it is. a. Sorry. And I think this is something that we've kind of been talking a bit about with the next generation VLA, mm -hmm. which would be a lot more sensitive than the VLBA. Oh, so you said, but you said VLBI or VLBA? Well, VLBI is the technique, so and I don't really care which facility does it. As long no, but I mean, it, just the interferometry is. I I I think I I I know I'm I'm, I'm just a curious, but observing the whole sky in interferometry seems a bit hard. Uh, okay, so I, I think it's gotten a lot easier because of the development of software correlators for the VLBA. So. Um, what yeah so the for the radio interferometry your field of view is still the angular resolution of a single dish right and the problem is you have to do a separate correlator pass for every phase center you put on uh but what you would do is you would already you would take advantage of a survey that already told you where all the sources were okay. and so you'd only put the phase centers on the known sources uh and then you could effectively do an all sky survey without actually correlating the whole sky okay so in that way so in a two-step way i can see it yeah um, and, and to some extent, this is discussed in Laura Black's science book chapter for the next generation VLA, um, something like this. Uh, and so I think that may be the one way that we might have a chance to uh, go after this kind of system. Um, so some of this discussion brought up one of the questions I had for you. Is, is that all right, Marta, uh, Maria? 
Yes, go ahead. And after that, we move to the audience because she's getting animated. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so what do you expect the spins of the earliest black holes to look like? Is that a way that we might figure out what mechanism one of these things formed by? Uh, well, <clears throat> let's say there are different views on what are the most typical spins of black holes in the early universe. Um, if you imagine, so, okay, so there is one way of, of evolving spin that is not controversial, which is what happens when you merge black holes. And if you have a sufficient large larger number of mergers, the, well, actually not that large, but yeah, anyway, this a asymptotic value for the spin will be about 0.7. Um, so if you have only mergers, you expect most black holes to have a spin on, around that. If you have accretion, it depends on how accretion proceeds. If you have the, that your accretion disk is kind of stable in terms of um, direction for a long time, then you have highly, highly spinning black holes and vice versa. And I would say that theoretically at the moment there are different views. And observationally, we only have information for a handful of AGN at low redshift that are also controversial. So I think that spin is controversial from the theoretical and observational point of view. I agree, yeah. I, what I was kind of getting at was my naive guess would be that um, if you started off with a massive star and you didn't have strong winds, you would oh, so probably have more okay. angular momentum than it, the black hole could hold. For this, so, this is just for the collapse itself. Yeah. Okay, so on top of my head, I only remember the works by Shapiro and his collaborators. This was about 20 years ago, if I remember correctly, um, in which they were expecting the spin to be sufficiently large, uh, higher than 0.5, if I remember correctly. I mean, this is stuff that I read in 2005, so I, I don't have the full memory. Um, I think that there, there are more recent works, but to be honest, I haven't kept updated on this. Okay, let me move now to the audience since we have a few questions there. So um, first one is uh, for both Tom and Martha um, asking whether there are any electromagnetic signatures for binary intermediate mass black holes. Okay, uh, um, do they mean things that are actively binaries right now? Indeed, indeed. Well, indeed, indeed the question was preceded by can actually they be gravitationally bound? I mean, like two intermediate mass black holes. Okay. I, I would say if you had a pulsar near it, then you would have, be able, you would see that in the pulsar timing. And if you had stars orbiting really close, then you might also see that the orbits didn't make sense with a single mass there. Um, so I think those things could work, but you'd have to be really lucky about how nature set itself up. Um, and. For supermassive black holes, I know uh, Scott Noble and various other people have done some simulations about what the accretion disks onto a supermassive black hole binary would look like. And uh, in the fairly late stages, you get some quasi-periodic oscillations in the X-ray luminosity uh, that you might go look for. Hmm. Um, yeah. I don't know if you have anything else, uh, Marta. No, yeah. I mean. In terms of intermediate mass black holes per se, um, I think it just kills with the mass, as far as I know. And again, as, as Tom said earlier, I think it depends on whether you, you talk about things that are, say, in a globular cluster or in a galactic center where you may have an AGN. Um, may, may have an AGN, just, you have a significant amount of gas. Um, so I think that this is this is the question. I mean, it, it 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 really, if we understand or if I understand correctly the question, it just the question boils down to: Is there matter around an intermediate mass black hole binary? Yeah. I think this is the more the, the easier way for me to to rephrase it. Um, and we don't know. I mean, if I think of a situation like if, you, if we have an intermediate mass black hole in, in the center of Fornax, a dwarf spheroidal, where there is one star per cubic parsec, there is no gas, I would not expect much to happen. But then in, if you are if you are in a in a very gas-rich starburst dwarf, then you may have something. So uh, I don't think that there is a, a clear answer, and it depends on the 
environment that you're looking at. Okay, now a question for Marta. What is starting mass does a, ha does a black hole um, have to have to become supermassive already by redshift of, say, accreting at the Eddington limit? Um, it's about, a trash is seven, you said? Yes. Uh, it's several hundred solar masses. Okay. You so you, yeah, 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 yeah. The answer is uh, several hundred solar masses, and you have to create at the Eddington limit continuously. And when I say continuously, I mean continuously. No. Okay, there, perhaps a follow up for me there. So, in the if you had if you had a stellar mass black hole, would you actually get there by accreting super Eddington all the time? Ah, super Eddington. Crazy thing. No, no, this is a follow up. So yeah. Well, super Eddington, you know, breaks all barriers. <laughs> In some sense, uh, in the sense that we cannot use the simple scaling that we use, I mean, to see if a black hole of a given mass can reach a given mass by yes, a, a given time or redshift at the Eddington limit, you just have an exponential function. So you invert it, you have a logarithm when you find the, 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 the ratio of the masses. Um, but if you're a super Eddington, then you know, it depends on how much super Eddington you can go, point one. And to me, this is more interesting, which is the duty cycle. Can you be super Eddington for a very long time? Or the energy injection, and especially the jet that you are launching from this seed black hole will stop accretion. So you will have a very short duty cycle. So, I mean, to me, this is the, these are the interesting questions. Um, so from the mathematical point of view, yes. I mean, if you, if you increase uh, the Eddington rate, and you just do the, 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 the equation, you can do whatever you want. But then under which conditions you have the gas inflow, for how long, how does the galaxy react to the injection of energy? These are the questions that we are trying to address you know, as a community. Okay. And uh, a question perhaps to both of you. So which proof do we have that red Six quasars are truly supermassive black holes. Which observational signatures are being used to argue this? Redshift quasars, redshift six quasars, that they're supermassive at all, or that they're like almost well over 10 well, the, the question is whether the measurements are reliable, I guess, <laughs> for supermassive. Uh, okay, so I could say two things here. Um, the first one is that their spectra are very similar to the spectra of quasars that we see at lower redshift. So the same physical processes are at play to, to power quasars at redshift 7 as they are at redshift 3, 2, 1. So in some sense, you can use Occam's razor and say, well, if I believe that at redshift 1 I have a quasar and that's powered by supermassive black hole, then it's the same at redshift 7. Uh, the other is, um, suppose now that we have, I mean, this is the question about if there are black holes, then if they're massive enough, uh, they're all, their luminosities suggest that if they're massive, actually underestimated, then these sources are all largely super Eddington. So you have either to believe there are super duper massive black holes out there, or there is super Eddington accretion. I'm fine with both. I mean, to me, both questions are very interesting. Um, but I think that the observer should say something more here. Oh, I, I think you actually answered it perfectly. <laughs> I, I could only just repeat what you just said. Man, I have to change job. I have to switch to. <laughs> yep, you're going to have to install IRAF on your laptop now. <laughs> OK. So one very general one, um, what answers do you hope to get from a detection of an intermediate mass black hole? What is the importance of uh, detecting them? Uh, I, I think you can look at this from a couple of different perspectives. So, so one is some of the extreme mass ratio in spiral stuff that Marta was talking about. Uh, that gives you different ways of probing general relativity than when you have the more equal mass ratios. So the fact that they might exist and therefore might produce gravitational wave mergers in that regime is important from a fundamental physics perspective. Uh, but then the other uh, questions are, you know, how do uh, supermassive black holes grow and are there cases where the supermassive black hole formation process uh, gets arrested? Uh, and also for 
if they're in globular clusters, how does that affect the whole dynamics of a, a star cluster? Because putting one very massive object in there can really change the way the whole cluster evolves. So those are kind of my perspectives on that. Oh, I make black holes. I don't look for them. So <laughs> anything is good with me. No, but uh, so what over the years I found interesting is really asking to people who work on intermediate mass black holes, what do you mean by intermediate mass black holes and, and why do you look for them? And the answers are all over the place, depending on the field where these people are coming from. So um, I think that different people have different answers simply. Sure. Okay, so next one. Um, the mass function of black holes increases with decreasing mass with a peak around 10 to the five solar masses. Um, so this was in the plots that Martha showed. Um, so there is a, this very significant cutoff uh, at uh, 10 to the five solar masses. So it seems that the intermediate mass black holes would be very rare. Um, so would you agree with this? I mean, so Martha suggested that intermediate mass black holes may not be special, but apparently they are very special because they are not observed at all. So first a disclaimer, if I may. <laughs> yeah, that figure dates back a couple of years, a few years, so it doesn't include all the um, recent detections of what it, let's say low mass massive black holes in nearby galaxies. So as you have noticed, I had to add NGC 205 by hand. Um, so to be honest, uh, that figure was given to me very kindly by Monica Colpi. I couldn't ask her to redo the whole calculation just for me. So um, I think it would be nice. I mean, I know that there are more so there are estimates of the black hole mass function um, done more um, as papers rather than in illust illustrative purposes. So I would refer you to those rather than a figure that was done a couple of years ago. Yes, you said the definition of intermediate mass black hole is a moving target, right? <laughs> so Okay, so um, next question. Did simulations like Illustris produce the intermediate mass black holes? Okay, I think that this is me. Uh, no, uh, this, the reason is simply in the assumptions. Um, now, I, I could go on talking about this for one hour, but I will not. Now, if you're an observer, uh, so I think that this question is, I should, I, I will address this question assuming that the person who asked was, was an observer. If you're an observer, usually you have to use, to choose between a very deep, small survey or a very wide, shallow survey. It's the same with, the, with simulations. You can have a very tiny, um, high resolution simulation that resolve very small masses or a very, large simulation that does not resolve small masses. Now, Illustris is the second kind. So it has many, many, many massive galaxies in a large universe, but it does not contain dwarf galaxies. So since the, the, the black hole a mass at birth, by definition in the simulation, it's put by hand and it's 10 to the five solar masses or so, this is the minimum mass that you can see. So point one, there is a, a, an absolute limit, which is what we call the particle mass. And also there is a more relative limit, which is the specific volume and resolution of your simulation. So if you want to see an intermediate mass black hole in your simulation, you have to have a much higher resolution, which means that you can simulate a small volume, which is okay in some sense, because if you're looking for dwarf galaxies, dwarf galaxies are very common. Uh, in terms of you know, number per cubic megaparsec. So with a small simulation at higher resolution, you can look for intermediate mass black holes. And we are, so stay tuned. Okay, and uh, one other question um, discusses the, the, that there are claims of broken black hole host scaling relations, so I guess uh, the M sigma is meant. Um, so with a steeper relation at low black hole masses. So are such results solid and if confirmed, which are the theoretical implications? Uh, so I think this might be something, this is something, that, you know, I'm the observer here, but this is not my narrow area of expertise. But my understanding of that is that there, there 
reasonably strong, but uh, it's really hard to get really precise black hole masses down at the low mass end of that range. So uh, you have to take extra care in, in doing that stuff. And I don't want to make too strong a statement about that. Uh, I think Mark I can comment on the implications regardless of whether it's real. Uh, yeah, whether it would be. From the theoretical point of view, there is, I mean, I showed you on some M sigma relations in my talk. I think that depending on the assumptions that you make, you have different predictions. Um, so as, as far as I know, when I looked at the observational um, measurements of the M sigma relation, I'm thinking mostly as, again, of uh, the cases that were added in the last couple of years from very nearby galaxies. Um, the M sigma relation seems to be the strongest relationship. I mean, in the sense that it behaves better than relationships with the bulge mass, for instance. Um, so my personal view is at the moment, there are no hints that the M sigma relation deviates strongly. But this is based on so few objects that I would not draw any conclusions from it. And from the, again, from the theoretical point of view, you have predictions that are, that are kind of different depending on the assumptions that you make. And I mean, if you want, I can go on and give you all the list, but it would be a bit tedious for some people, I think. Uh, perhaps related to this, um, another uh, person in the audience asks, uh, how, I mean, what is the limitation for not having black holes in the studies of clusters evolution? So there is, there seems that there is no sign of black holes in the early universe studies. Why is that? Is that the same as you referred to before of the illustrious simulations? Or? Uh, sorry, can you, I uh, haven't understood the question really. Yes, it says it is well known that black holes are used in a study of clusters evolution but what is the main problem that there is not any sign of them in the early universe studies? Oh, gotcha. Okay, so I, th I think that the question refers to the limited or null detection for the moment of faint EGN in uh, deep observations. I don't know what this has to do with clusters though. I don't know if it is stellar clusters or galaxy clusters. Anyway, so if this is about the early universe and detection of faint AGN, um, this has been shown, well, again, it's one of the controversial topics, I would say. Um, there are groups that find some faint AGN in, in very high ashes galaxies and other groups who find this not to be the case. So I think that the answer is still very much in, um, in the course of being studied. But now let us assume that there are no detections of faint AGN at high redshift. This means that there are very, very few uh, active black holes in these galaxies. You can explain it in two ways. Either there are very few black holes and then you have to form black holes later on, or there are black holes there, but they don't accrete much. My personal view is that black holes are there, but they don't accrete much. Um, especially, this was something that was found by different groups in the last five years, I would say. Um, we find that when uh, in, in, the, in galaxies that have active star formation, therefore strong supernova, supernova explosion, which is un, not unlike in the early universe, supernovae can affect the growth of black holes just by, you know, in the same way that affects star formation in dwarfs. So um, my particular interpretation is that there are black holes in the harsh universe, they're just not very active. Um, and I think that in this particular aspect, simulations are now agreeing with observations that you should not see that many active black holes. To me, it's more difficult to explain how some of them are able to grow to, you know, to those huge masses that we see rather than explaining why most of them don't go at all. There's, there's one small point I would, I'd like to add there too. There's, there's also a possible um, bias that might affect the spectral shape of AGN at very high redshift, uh, which is if you're talking about things that probe the jet component at high redshift, uh, you, when you get up to a high enough redshift, the cosmic microwave background can act as a major source of seed photons. 
And so you can have less synchrotron emission and more Compton emission. And the Compton emission could be coming out in bands where you're not very good at finding it. Uh, and so that could make even moderately bright AGN harder to find because of that reason too. Okay, thanks. Okay, so we should close very soon. So I would now ask uh, Tom and Marta whether they have some very last uh, topic that they want to discuss very quickly. Well, I have one question, which is something that we discussed, you know, I think that you, Maria, also. So from the observation point, so the, one of the reasons why I kept on talking about gravitational waves measuring mass is that whenever we measure luminosity, it's always a problem. We have candidate into this mass black hole. So how would we go really from having candidates to having something that, you know, most observers would say, this is an intermittent mass black hole? Right, so I think it depends where we find the candidates. Um, so right now we have some of the candidates are in are, are the you know lowest mass AGN, and then in some of those cases, like I mentioned with the Nguyen and Nyland papers, there actually is at least an upper limit on the mass that puts it well below what most people call supermassive. So in that case, we're okay. Um, but uh, in other cases, like for HLX1, mm -hmm. I think what we really need is more powerful telescopes. So now, now that system uh, shows brightening phases every 300 days or so. And that suggests that it has a donor star that has an orbit of that period. And if we had much, much better optical telescopes, we might actually be able to go after that donor star. Um, and in that case, then we might have a single star doing the orbiting, and then we can use the techniques we use on stellar mass black holes, and then we're in much better shape. Um, and then the other cases, if we, we might get lucky with things like um, uh, pulsars uh, around uh, black holes that we can use to do very precise mass estimates. Uh, and one other thought I had uh, as I was getting prepared for this, I wanted to kind of turn back to you, uh, is one other thing that doesn't give us a precise mass, but in a statistical sense can give us a mass, is Brownian motion. Mm -hmm. And for supermassive black holes around 10 to the 6 or more, that's basically unmeasurable. Uh, maybe for Sagittarius A star, we could just barely do it. But as you lower the black hole mass, you increase the amount of Brownian motion it'll see. Um, and where you may get really lucky is the places where you'd be most likely to see an intermediate mass black hole light up would be if there's gas around. And I would think that that would be if you had an intermediate mass black hole in a star forming galaxy. Uh, because then you'd have gas around, so it might light up. And then you might have massive stars that cause more Brownian motion on it. Is that a scenario that you think might be uh, theoretically viable? Uh, I think you would need sufficiently massive stars if you want to see an appreciable Brownian motion. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the IMF yeah. is, is one of the most important questions that we have in the universe and still we don't know which are the most massive stars. So I think it's totally an open question. Yeah. And again, I was thinking, again, if we, yeah. if we get NGBLA going forward, we'd be able to do micro arc second positions in the best cases. And then some proper motions that seem crazy to measure now are actually within reach, even in extra galactic cases. Indeed. But I I guess at the end also the question is whether measurements that will be allowed in the local universe in the near future, whether they will help us to understand what happened in the early universe, I mean, whether you can really extrapolate back then. And it is, it is indeed with the observational methods, I, I agree with Mark, it's a bit uh, unsatisfactory that we have sometimes to use five of them to find an agreement or to believe a result. <laughs> Uh, of course, ideally, we would like to see a black hole at the moment it is born in a galaxy yes. far, far away. Um, there have been suggestions where, that with JWST and links, you could see them early on. It's not a super easy measurement, uh, but it's possible. Uh, Lisa should be seeing them at those redshifts as well, if they're there. So. I'm very optimistic for the future. Yes. OK, so I guess on this note, we can close. Um, it has been a real pleasure to have Marta and Tom and all the audience to discuss this hot and interesting topic. Many thanks to all of you, especially to Marta and Tom, for having agreed to participate. And I hope to enjoy the event as much as I did. 
And with this, I pass over to Giacomo to close. And so stay healthy and see you hopefully in the next dialogue. Yes, thank you very much also from my side. It was really enjoyable. Um, also, uh, so Tom and, and Marta and Maria, yes, for sharing and, and, and the, the event. Thank you so much. Um, Marta, thank you for mentioning that the IMF is the, one of the most important questions in science. In fact, we can anticipate that that's going to be uh, we are we are we are organizing an, a duologue on that topic, and so we will hopefully we'll be able to announce it uh, very soon. So stay tuned to everyone from the chat. Uh, just to let you know, there were to Marta and Thomas, there were roughly 300 people <laughs> listening to you, and then you know more than 200 people stayed tuned to listen to you. So really, congratulations and thank you so much for making everything so so enjoyable. Uh, and I thank everyone for being with us. Uh, and so stay tuned and see you soon. Thank you again. Bye bye.